Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thy forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and a peace that it Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings so bond with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Thank you. Well, good evening. Hope everyone's had a good week this week. It's good to be see you again. And um, just by way of announcements and prayer requests, let me just say that uh, we need to pray for our country, don't we? A lot of things going on, and um, so we need to pray for them. Uh, also, uh, the contribution records, I think they're ready. Uh, and if you, uh, there are going to be people listening online tonight and things like that. If you want it mailed to you, uh, please let the church office know. Um, you can you can uh, send an email, or you can you can call the church office in the in the office hours, and uh, and let let them know, and we'll we'll get that mailed to you. Uh, otherwise, we will stick them in the boxes back here in our mailboxes here at the church. And uh, so, but if you want that mailed, please let us know. We'll make sure you get that. So, and that's the contribution records for uh, 2020. And, uh, and I, let me just say a word about that. I appreciate your faithfulness. You know, it's been a crazy, crazy year, uh, 2020 was, and, and 2021 is shaping up to be similar. And, uh, and so I, I just want to say I appreciate your faithfulness in giving and your, uh, and your financial contributions with that. And, uh, and then also uh, we will wait, I think, uh, one more Sunday uh, before we send our check to about the uh, uh, Lottie Moon uh, Christmas offering. Um, give everybody a chance to get that in. So um, if you have yet to do that, maybe you had something that was outstanding. You, you wouldn't ha didn't have the opportunity to give it yet, and so you've got about one more week uh, to get it turned in, then we'll get that sent off uh, for our missions offering. All right. Um, as far as prayer requests go, I have several. And so um, I, won't, I won't rehearse the ones uh, from this past Sunday. Uh, there may be a couple of them on here. Um, Hannah, remember Hannah, she's got COVID. I, I t did talk to Shay earlier in the week, and, and she seems to be doing okay. Um, so remember them. Uh, and then I think there's other members in their family that have it. Uh, so just, just remember uh, their family. Uh, also, Carol Kearns, uh, this is uh, Kevin's dad. He's going for a scan this Friday uh, with a heart specialist. He's got a valve that's messed up, and they're trying to determine exactly what they're going to do with that. So remember Carol uh, Kearns. Then also, um, Robbie and uh, Kevin's cousin, Wayne Wilkes, uh, he did pass away. He had uh, several complications going on. He had some heart things, some kidney things. 
Um, and so, uh, but anyway, the Wayne Wilkes family, remember them. Um, and then uh, Lance Lammons sent this one in, or I guess Kelly did. Um, Wiley and Brenda Norman, these were former co-workers of Lance uh, who have COVID and not doing well. Also, Christy Detter's stepmom's parents also have COVID. And, um, and the dad, Albert, um, they have called Comfort Care in for, for him. So remember this family as well. And then also Jeannie's sister's in-laws, if you can follow that. Jeannie's sister's. That's Julie's in-laws. Okay, Julie's in-laws. Um, Dean and Gail Lambert, uh, they also have COVID, and, and Dean is in the hospital. So a lot of people, a lot of people sick, a lot of people uh, going through lots of things. And so uh, we need to lift those up in prayer. Again, remember to pray for our country. Um, the ones that I had mentioned last week, also remember all of those. There, there are several. Um, remember Kelly's dad, Tom Jones, who they discovered that they melanoma in the brain, and so remember that. Um, also, Tommy Hunsucker's uh, grandfather. I remember, remember those. So lots and lots to pray for. So let's go, to the Lord, in a word of prayer, and uh, to open up our service and remember these prayer requests. And oh, excuse me, I didn't ask anybody else have any other prayer requests, Ronnie. Is he just a friend, Bill? I, do I know? I, do I know him? I don't know him. Okay. Okay. All right. The Bill Morris family. Anyone else? No. Okay. All right. Let's go, to the Lord, and word of prayer. Lord, we want to come to you and just recognize that. Lord, we, the world we live in is full of corruption and full of sin, and Lord, uh, we're not exempt from it, and uh, Lord, we just want to thank you for who you are, and uh, Lord, we look to you because you're the only one uh, who can, who's in control. Lord, we have the illusion of control, but uh, we, we try to convince ourselves of it sometimes, but Lord, you're the one who is really in control, and Lord, we look to you and, and, uh, for our help and for in times of trouble. And Lord, we also want to thank you, even in times of trouble, for all that you are and, and, and the power that you have and the love that you have for your people. And uh, Lord, I, every prayer request that was mentioned tonight, Lord, I, those who are sick, and Lord, you can, you can touch and you can heal and you can comfort uh, like no one else can. And Lord, I pray you do that in their lives. And Lord, uh, the ones who have uh, been bereaved because they have lost their loved one, and Lord, I pray that again you would comfort them like only you can in these times and lord i pray you'd use all these situations to uh, for people to cast their eyes upon you and to lean on you like never before so that you can prove yourself to them and uh, again we just want to thank you for all you've done for us all you're going to do for us lord we thank you for your word that we're about to look into and lord we pray that you'd open our heart and mind that we can receive what you have for us and may we glean something from your word this evening thank you again for your love and mercy in jesus name amen all right, uh, let's go to back to the book of Hebrews. We kind of took a bit of a break there uh, for a couple weeks anyway. Uh, we're going to go back for, to Hebrews chapter, we're going to be started in chapter number 10. We're almost done with the book of Hebrews. Um, Hebrews has 12, 13 chapters, so uh, we're, we're nearing the end here. And we're going to cover a lot of ground tonight. I think I'm going to go through about at least about 18 verses, I think. We're going to try that, and we'll see how that goes. And just so I know we've taken a little bit of a break, I'm going to give you a real quick, real quick uh, uh, refresher here to, to, for, so that we can remember what we've been studying. And I want us to remember uh, that the book of Hebrews is about Jesus, the superiority of Jesus Christ, about Jesus being better than anything and everything. All right, and so we have gone through uh, Jesus being better than prophets, angels, Moses, Abraham, Joshua, all of that. Then we have... Uh, from generalities went into uh, Jesus being the better priest uh, in a better priesthood. And then also in the last chapter, we talked about it being a better covenant, the new covenant being better than the old covenant, and of course Jesus being the author and finisher of that. And, and tonight, 
part of all of that, we, we've went into pretty great detail with all that Levitical system, uh, the priest, the priesthood, the temple, the furnishings, and all of that being a, a type and a foreshadow uh, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. We went into that, and, and again, the priest, the priesthood, and tonight in chapter 10, it talks about Jesus being a better sacrifice. So we're, is, again, some of this is going to be similar to what we've looked at, but he gets into greater detail, go, goes, digs in a little deeper into that aspect of what we're talking about. And so uh, remember who the audience is here. He's speaking to believers uh, who have come out of Judaism, and he's reinforcing their faith, letting them know they've made the right decision. Jesus Christ is better. Also, he's talking to Judaizers um, who are still holding on to all those rituals and, and, and the things of the old covenant, the things in the temple, uh, the old priesthood, all those things. They're still trying to hold on to that. And, uh, and he's, he's uh, making a good argument about why they should leave that and, and to lay hold of Christ. So now as we get into chapter 10, uh, there's just really two points, two main points I want to give you tonight in these 18 verses. But let's just go through and read it, uh, beginning in, in chapter 10, verse number 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they have not ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of a book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offerings, and burnt offerings, and offerings for sin thou wouldest not, neither had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice, which can never take away sin. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost is also a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law into their heart, and into their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Now, as we've gone through this book of Hebrews, he's using the Old Testament basically to speak to these, uh, these Jewish believers and these Jewish unbelievers, those that were uh, considering Christ, looking at Christ, but still trying to hold on to some of those rituals. And he's gone through that, and he's using Old Testament verses, the Old Covenant verses, the Old Testament, if you would, to make his point, and how that they need to, they need to see uh, the Old Testament for what it really is. It's just a picture, it's just a shadow. As a matter of fact, I think I've said this before, but the Old Testament is, is Jesus Christ concealed, and in the New Testament is Jesus Christ revealed. And how he was concealed in the Old Testament was all these pictures and types and foreshadows, and it has been mentioned over and over again as we've gone through this, uh, being a type and a foreshadow. Uh, even the temple, the articles of the furniture, the sacrifices, the cleansings, everything in every detail is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it was to show us of what, what was to come, uh, the Jewish believers there. Or, or the Jewish nation, let me say, not necessarily believers, but even unbelievers uh, that were still living in Judaism. And so as we've gone through uh, some of these, and, uh, and, and we think about uh, chapter 9, we dealt with uh, the reasons for Christ's death, the reason for his death, and in and, and verse 16 we talked about uh, the will 
or, or, or how a will works. A will is no good until the person who willed it died. Is that right? And so that, that's how the new covenant works as well. And, uh, and so there has to be a testator. We talked about that. And also the death of Jesus Christ gave forgiveness uh, once and for all. Uh, those Old Testament sacrifices, that Old Testament system, it could not offer lasting forgiveness. It was every year. And again, this is, some of this is, is going to be reiterated in chapter 10 here. And then in verse 28 of chapter 9, it talks about the substitution uh, of Jesus Christ, how it's, uh, he substitutes, he takes our place uh, for us. He takes on uh, the wrath of God and gives to us his righteousness, the substitute. All right, so as we go into chapter 10 here, let's look, and, and basically it begins to, th to talk about the failure of animal sacrifices or the shortcomings of animal sacrifices, and, uh, it, which, which was in the Old Covenant. So let's go to verse number 1 again. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the thing, can never with those sacrifices which they offered, year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. Now, that, that phrase, comers thereunto perfect, we looked at um, something uh, in chapter 7, verse number 19. That word, excuse me, that word perfect, let me find it here. Chapter 7, verse 19, it says this, For the law made nothing perfect. But the bringing in of a better hope did by which we draw nigh unto God. Now, that word perfect it ha is related to drawing nigh to God. It does not mean perfection, per se. Uh, it means the ability to draw nigh to God. The new covenant has given us that. It affords us that, the ability to draw nigh to God. And this ought to be the desire of every person to ever live. Uh, this was the desire of all that were in Judaism, is to draw nigh to God. But that old system could not deliver that. They could not allow. There was still the veil. There was the outer courts. We went through all of that. And so when you think about this Old Testament system, uh, again, that shadow of good things to come, and, uh, and making the comers there into prayer, it could not do that. It could not do that. So the, f the failure of animal sacrifice, or the failure of the blood sacrifice of animal, of innocent animals, the first shortcoming is, is that there was no access to God. There was, that you could not access God. And that is, that is dealt with in verse number one. Look, look what it says in, again. Uh, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of things, Look, look at the next phrase. Can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, the comers there unto perfect. That it could never offer access to God. It could never, no one could ever go into the presence of God in this system. Again, we, we understand the high priest, and, and that, that was a special office. So, but I'm talking about everyone else, everyone else. Uh, the other priest, the other people, the other ones that brought the sacrifices, the ones who raised the lambs, the ones who inspected the lambs, although none of those had access to God. None of them could. And uh, so this was, this was the shortcomings of this system. All right, so th they could never have a full relationship with the Lord, uh, never have a full relationship with God because of this. Uh, they could never get into the presence of God, and they, they would go over and over again, you know, it's like I told you before, if I have a picture of my mother and I can look at it over and over and over again, it's not the same thing as, as seeing my mother face to face. Is that the same thing? No, it's not. And so he's saying here, all of these sacrifices that you're sacrificing over and over and over and over, it's not doing you a bit of good. It, it, this is just a picture. This is just a foreshadow. And, uh, and, and it's not, this is not the real thing. It is just a picture. And uh, so no access to God. And then secondly, the shortcoming of animal sacrifices. Verse number two, for then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sin. It could not remove sin. The animal sacrifices could not remove sin. Now, it, it talks about re remembering sin. I think... Uh, Verse number three, but in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. You know, the one thing about the new covenant, the new covenant, Jesus Christ paid the debt once for all, 
it is in the past, never to be pulled up again, isn't it? The Bible tells us as far as the east is from the west, it's in the depths of the ocean, and man has not even discovered how deep the ocean is yet, you know? And, uh, and so they're, they're gone. Our sins are gone. But in the, in, the, in the old covenant, that's the new covenant I'm talking about, but now the old covenant, every single year, there was a remembrance of sin. You know, they had to think back, okay, what did I do this year? I got to go offer the sacrifice. I got to go give this lamb. I've got to do all these things. And it was in every year. You know what? You may forget your anniversary. How many's ever done that? Uh-oh, Danny. <laughs> He's done that before, huh? And, uh, and so you may have forgotten a birthday. And, uh, and, and you may have forgotten anything like that. But here's the thing. In the old covenant, if you forgot that, Passover lamb, if you forgot that time of sacrifice, if you forgot that, what would happen? Do you understand what I'm saying? So they were always in fear of God's judgment because they were always in fear, uh, never knowing if, if they could, if it was a complete sacrifice, if it, if it was paid in full, it was always, because they would come daily sacrificing. As a matter of fact, uh, I was reading something and they said something about on the, on the Day of Atonement or, or, or Passover, I mean, the Passover, that there were so many lambs in that, in that time frame that were, that were slaughtered, so many lambs. And I, I read something that said like 300,000 in, in, that, in that time frame. And it said there was so much blood that, that was shed during those times that it would run out of the temple and into the Kidron Valley. That's how much blood we're talking about. All these sacrifices, hundreds of thousands of animals over and over and over. And none of them could remove sin. Every year they were having to go back to deal with this. Every year. And it was a, a constant reminder that these sacrifices were insufficient. Constantly reminding. Uh, and so, if, and he's talking about God being satisfied. There is a remembrance. Let me go back. For there would not have ceased to, offered, uh, ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sin. And this thing about conscience of sin has to do with guilt. It has to do with guilt. There was a constant, I don't know, eating at them about the guilt of sin. You know, they didn't have the Holy Spirit living inside of them like we have, bearing witness. All they had was the high priest, and they would wonder if the high priest went in to do exactly and, and crossed every T and dotted every I to make sure God was satisfied at that particular moment. But honestly, we're going to look at this, but God was never satisfied with any animal sacrifice, never. And so the, the, the shortcomings of these animal sacrifices, there was no access to God. And, uh, and there was no removal of sin. Uh, again, this conscience, this guilt thing. And, and let, me, let me, all of us in here, if you know Christ is your Savior, uh, then, and you know the laws that God gives in his word, you know, don't tell a lie or honor your father, father and mother or thou shalt not steal or, or any of those things or lust. You know, Jesus gave us one about looking on a woman. Uh, to lust after her, that means we've committed adultery already. And so all of these laws that we have, and if we look at that in the Old Testament, when, when those laws were given, and, and they understood that, look, they broke the law all the time. It was all the time they broke the law. And so, you know, they, they were constantly, okay, did I, did I, did I make that sacrifice? Did, did I, they had daily sacrifices that they would do. And so sometimes if you knew that you had sinned, you would go offer a sacrifice to God. And so over and over again, so anyway, it, it could not remove sin, it only covered sin for a little while. And, uh, and so they were always in fear of the judgment of God, that, that's, that's how they lived. And so this is the, uh, the failure of animal sacrifices, and then, now we're going to look at in the re remainder of these verses that we read, the fulfillment of Jesus' sacrifice. So let's start in verse number, uh, well, let me read verse number four just to reiterate what we've already talked about. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. It is not possible. God will never be satisfied with the sacrifice of an animal. By the way, all of those sacrifices that were to be made, when you came to bring those sacrifices, the idea, in, at least in God's mind, was for you to come in obedience and, and, and to offer that sacrifice. And not only in obedience, but to come in a, in a position of humility and repentance uh, to bring that sacrifice, and also of faith, knowing that uh, 
the, the real sacrifice was supposed to come. You know, you're, you're doing this on behalf, but it became something that God hated because it became a ritual. People would go, you remember the, the Israel, the life of Israel. They would go and they would, they would begin to worship Baal. They would bring immorality into their ranks and it became rampant. And then they were living that way and then, and then on the Sabbath they would go, okay, well, we've got to go to the temple today and offer our sacrifice. It just became something to justify what they were doing or just to cover what they were doing instead of coming, coming humbly with repentance and humility and a love for God and an obedience to God. It became, it became something completely different than what, what God had intended for it to be in that picture of what the Lord Jesus Christ in that sacrifice. So anyway, the fulfillment of Jesus' sacrifice. Now, if you want to go and look at this, you can. There's two, there's two Old Testament verses, two Old Testament passages that are given in the passage that we already read. One of them is Psalm 40, verse 6 through 8, if you want to go study this later on. The other one is going to be Jeremiah 31, 31. And uh, I think we'll go and look at Jeremiah here in a bit. But basically, uh, Psalm 40, uh, look in verse number 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Now, this is a conversation. Now, you have to remember this is also in, in the psalm. Psalm chapter 40, these verses. So this has happened. These verses were written and were given before Jesus Christ was ever born of a virgin. All right, you with me? All right, so even then, so we, we can say in eternity past, there was a conversation going on between God and, and God the Father and God the Son, and, ha, and, and the whole plan of redemption. And he says here, a body thou hast prepared me. And so there was something that God was doing uh, behind the scenes. Yes, he had instituted the old covenant to be all these pictures and all of these types and all of these shadows, but God had prepared a body. And that was the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, not to be the not to be the 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 shadow, but to be the reality of all, what all of those shadows were picturing. All right, so let, let's read on. But a body thou hast prepared me, and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of a book; it is written of me to do thy will. Now, the picture or, or the type cannot fulfill what the reality did. And, and by the way, this was God's eternal plan from, from before the foundation of the world. You can go, uh, I think I wrote a verse down here somewhere. Uh, Revelation 13, 8. Let me, let me just go read that. Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. Of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All right, so before the foundation of the world, before God ever formed the world, this was the plan. And he's saying that, that God had prepared a body for this, and this was the body that, the Lord, that he gave the Lord Jesus Christ to become that sacrifice that was pleasing. And remember when Jesus walked on the earth, and what was the statements that God the Father made about him? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And then it says here, these sacrifices, what did it say? Verse number 6, I can have no pleasure in those animal sacrifices, but there's one sacrifice that I can have pleasure in, and that, and, and that satisfies me, and that is the body that I have prepared and given uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the God the Son. And by the way, he's saying here, this is, this is uh, Psalm 40. Uh, I've told you that already. And it, remember who the audience he's talking to. He's talking to these Jewish people. And he says, lo, I come, and it says, in the volume of a book, it is written of me. He's saying, look, everything that I've told you about these sacrifices, everything that I've told you about these old covenants, everything that I've told you about the priesthood, the priest, all of that, everything that I've told you is you need to go, and it's in the Old Testament, it's in the Old Covenant, that all of these things were going to be done away, and the plan of God uh, before the foundation of the world, before he ever instituted the Old Covenant. Uh, that, that, that this new covenant was going to come on the scene. And so you need to go back and look. It is written in the book. You need to see it. It is written, it has been given to you, and you need to see it. Uh, in the Old Testament, the, all of these verses, again, Psalm 40, and then Jeremiah 31 that we're going to look at here in just a moment. So uh, 
it is written in the book. He's well pleased. Um, all right, let's go down to verse number 8. Uh, and, and again, this is a repetition of that same verse. And above, when he said, Sacrifice an offering, and burnt offerings, and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Now, this is... This is uh, interesting because he he says that he's taking away the first that means he's doing away with the old covenant the old covenant the old system is being done away and he's ushering in the new now this is the fulfilling of of the Lord Jesus Christ the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ Uh, and then again we're seeing the insufficiencies of the old the, the animal sacrifices, and then the superiority uh, of the, the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so he's taking away the first and establishing the second. This, this is what the Lord Jesus Christ did. And then the third thing, look in verse number 10, by the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So sanctified. Could those old Testament animal sacrifices, could they sanctify a person? Now, the word sanctify means to make holy. It also means to set apart unto God. That's what that means. Could, could those old sacrifices, could they do that? Could they take a person and make someone holy? Could they take a person and set that person apart unto God? Could, could they separate them, sanctified? This is where we get the word saint as well. It's derived from that. Uh, could any of those Old Testament sacrifices, those animal sacrifices, do anything like that? No. But the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ could. Uh, And by the way, uh, let let me go back to verse number 10. By which he also sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse number 11, and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice which can never take away sin. Again, you see that away, never take away sin, that old sacrifice. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down on the right hand of God. So, uh, the first thing that this accomplishes, that the sacrifice of Jesus, the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, what it accomplished is that it it accomplishes the plan of God from eternity past. That was his plan all along. It accomplishes that. We've already seen that. And then also, uh, it takes away the first covenant, establishes the second covenant. It sanctifies the believers. The old covenant could not do that. And then the fourth thing that it does is it takes away sin. That's what it says here. Uh, verse 11, and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice which can never take away sin. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down on the right hand of God. So that Old Testament sacrifice could never take away sin. It only covered it and piled it up and, and, and kept sweeping it under the rug, all right, until the perfect sacrifice came. All those foreshadows, all those types, it couldn't fulfill what the reality could. And uh, that's what he did. He took, he took away sin. And, uh, and then in verse 11 and verse number 12, uh, it actually does a comparison here. Um, but let, let's look at it just a moment. Verse number 11, for every priest, what's that next word? Standeth. All right, they go down to verse number 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin, what did he do? Sat down. So there, there's a contrast there. There's a, there's a standing and there's a sitting down. What does that imply? One, one thing implies, and we're going to look at this in just a moment, that he, his work was done. He's accomplished. He's the victor. Uh, there's no more need for any more work to be done. All right? That, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is a comparison of those, those two um, sacrifices there. All right? Let's look, at, let's look at another one. All right? Uh, standing versus sitting. All right? And then it says, verse number 11, For every priest standeth, how often? Daily. Daily. And then it says, ministering and offering oftentimes, daily and oftentimes, the same sacrifice which can never take away sin. But this man, when he had offered one sacrifice, now they're doing it daily and oftentimes. This is one sacrifice, one. There's a comparison there. They did many, he did one. Because there was no need for another. 
again, and then we see it could, the other sacrifices could never take away sin. And then the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, it did away with sin forever. So they're really, when we're talking about superiority of Jesus Christ, when we're talking about the sacrifice, there is no comparison. I mean, one was a picture, one was a type, one was a foreshadow, but the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ and him being the perfect sacrifice, there is no comparison. He did what none of the other sacrifice could do. He took away sin. He completed the will of God and the plan of God. He sanctifies believers. He takes away the first covenant to establish uh, the, the second covenant. All of these things. Now let's read on down to the next verses. Verse 13, from henceforth. Now, from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstools. Now, there's a lot of things that happened at the cross. Yeah, and we, we talk about our sins being paid for, and it did. We talk about, you know, uh, the wrath of God being poured out upon him, and it did. But there's some other things that happened here. And you know, the enemies that we have, we have death, hell, and the grave, right? That, those are enemies, and every one of those were defeated at the cross. You realize that. And so he was victor. And so because of the sacrifice that he made, because he established the second one, he did away with the, with the first one, and he's establishing the second one with his sacrifice, it, uh, he, he, it, esta- it establishes superiority over his enemies, Again, Satan, remember all the way back in Genesis 3.15, it was going to bruise the, the heel of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it was going to crush the head of Satan. All of this has happened uh, at the cross. All of it did with that sacrifice, the sacrifice of himself. All right, let's read down just a little bit more. Uh, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now, okay, so again, that word perfection, what do we say that was talking about? That was not talking about living in perfection. That was, positionally speaking, we are perfect. Uh, As far as God is concerned, we've been made holy. As a matter of fact, in one other place, it says that we're already seated in heavenly places. And so as far as God is concerned, if we are in Christ Jesus, we are already seated in heaven with him, positionally speaking. All right, And, and... he perfected them that are sanctified. And that, that means that we have access to God. If we have been made holy, that means we have access to God. That's what's sanctified. We now have access to him. We've been made holy through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the sacrifice that he made for us. And we've accepted that by faith. He's become our Savior. And, and we believe in him with all that we have. And, and therefore, he has opened the way. And, uh, and we, now, we now can enter into the presence of God and have full relationship and full fellowship with God himself because of the sacrifice that God made. Uh, let's go on down a little bit, the sacrifice that Jesus made. Verse number 15, Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after the days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Now, the other thing that the the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ presented or that it accomplished was that it fulfilled the promise that God made all the way back in the Old Testament. Let's go back to Jeremiah 31. And this is going to sound real familiar to what we had just read. Now remember, yes, had God ushered in the Old Covenant through Moses? Yes, he did. To offer these types and pictures and foreshadows, okay? But then he's also promised in his word through Jeremiah that he was going to usher in a new covenant. Now look, in Jeremiah 31, 31, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, 
and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. For the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Now this is a promise that was made well before Jesus Christ was ever walked on this earth. This was God's plan all along. And this was to bring in and to usher in a new covenant. And the writer of Hebrews is reiterating this and, and and, and, and trying to get those that were entrenched in Judaism to let them realize that, look, this was the, the fulfillment of God's promise. The new covenant was the fulfillment of God's promise that he had made from Jeremiah. And he's saying this. He's saying, look, if you're going to reject Jesus Christ, if you're, if you're going to stick with Judaism and you're going to stick with the rituals that are there, and you're going to reject Jesus Christ, and this is what you're going to have to reject. You're going to have to reject, first of all, the Holy Spirit. Look in verse 15. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness for us, for after that he had said before. And then, then it goes into the, the 16 and, and 17 are the verses from Jeremiah. Now, all of those, in the, the Jews in the Old Testament... Uh, the vast majority of them believed when a prophet spoke, it was speaking from the Lord and it was from the Holy Spirit, okay? And so if they were going to reject this message of who Jesus Christ was, that he was superior to that Old Testament system, if they were going to reject that, then they're going to have to reject, first of all, what the Holy Spirit is saying. Secondly, what they believed the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah was an outstanding prophet. Everybody knew him to be a prophet. So they're going to have to reject Jeremiah as a prophet and not believe what Jeremiah says. And then also they're going to have to reject the Old Testament because of, of what is contained therein. And, and they're going to have to reject all of that if they're going to reject Christ. But the fact of the matter is that, that Jesus Christ comes, and that is a fulfillment of all that God had promised. It, it, he has shown this throughout this book of Hebrews, through these Old Testament verses, of who, who Jesus really is. And so now let's go on down to verse 18. Well, let me read 16 and 17 again. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. This is quoting Jeremiah. Saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their heart and their minds will I write them and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now remember, the old, the old system, it, it brought a remembrance of sin every single year. But this new, this new covenant is going to be, they're going to not remember the sin anymore. And so there's the difference. And, and the difference... In it was the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not the sacrifice of animals, but the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look in verse 18. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. He said, if you're going to reject the offering of Jesus Christ, then there, there's no more animal sacrifice that's going to help you. You know, there, there's no more other way, uh, it, because all those other sacrifices, looking at the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, makes all those other sacrifices useless, senseless, needless, futile, unprofitable, and unnecessary. Because he's made this, and none of them are pleasing to God. Again, the whole system was designed in the Old Testament uh, for a person to be in obedience to God, to God's will, to be submissive and humble in their heart as they offered that sacrifice to God by faith. And, uh, but it became a ritual. It became something that, you know, they're going to live however how they want to. And, uh, and, and, and just, you know, on the Sabbath that come, or whenever they needed to come and make that sacrifice and all their sins would be covered and it would be all right. We're going to talk a little more deeper on that, on that aspect about uh, uh, sin in, in, in the life. Uh, but that was the intent. The intent was for obedience and submission and humility and love, uh, but it became something, something else. And uh, all those sacrifices were not pleasing to God. The only sacrifice that will ever be pleasing to God is the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the only way you'll ever have access to the presence of God is through the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way that you'll ever, uh, th th this is the plan of God. It always has been since the foundation of the world. And this is uh, the only way to God. And uh, the only way to take away sin, uh, the only other way just covered it, uh, but if you reject Jesus Christ, just like it says here, if you reject that, you're rejecting, uh, again, he's speaking to Jewish, Jewish people, you're, respecting, you're, you're, you're rejecting the Old Testament, you're rejecting the Holy Spirit, you're rejecting Jeremiah if you're rejecting, if you're rejecting Jesus Christ. And so uh, when we get into this, uh, he's going to begin to talk about faith. We've talked about the comparisons, a lot of comparisons. 
between the old system and the new system, the old covenant, the new covenant, the old priesthood, the new priesthood. We've looked at a lot of those things as we've gone through Hebrews. But now uh, we're starting to get into what constitutes salvation, what, 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 that, what that really means. And so, and, and he begins, when we pick it up next time, he's going to start talking about faith and, and, and what all that means. And chapter 11 is going to continue uh, with that, with that uh, whole line of thinking about faith. And how, and, and many times there are questions that are asked. I get this all the time. How was somebody in the Old Testament saved? They were saved exactly the same way a New Testament person is saved. And that is by faith. It is by faith uh, in the coming. They looked ahead at the coming sacrifice. We look back at the sacrifice who has already come. It's the same way. And we, we cast our faith and our trust in him and, and what he's done. And they did the exact same thing. Now, there are things that we live in obedience uh, just like the things in the Old Testament, there were things that they did to live in obedience. Um, but nevertheless, the superiority of the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ is far superior. It did what none of those animal sacrifices could do in the Old Testament. None of them. It offered permanent solutions. It offered a way to God. It offered the cleansing of sin, not the covering of sin. It offered all of those things. And, uh, and he, he's gone through making his case of why Jesus is so much better. And we've looked at that all the way through, all the way up through, up to chapter 10. And, uh, and so we're going to get into a little more of the faith side of that as we continue this study, all right? And so anyway, Jesus is better. I don't care what you, what you, what you put him up against. He's better. He's better. All right? And no matter what life throws at you. He's still there, and he's better. I'm telling you, he will overcome any circumstance, any situation, and uh, he's better. Uh, no matter what we look at, we always can place our eyes on him because he's, he's king, he's Lord. All enemies are going to put under his feet. We've seen, we've seen that in, the, in this chapter even tonight. And uh, anyway, keep your eyes on him. Keep trusting him. Keep looking to him. He's better. Amen. Let's laugh for a word, word of prayer. Father, we again want to tell you how much we love you. And Lord, we're so grateful for the sacrifice that you made for us. You took our place. You substituted yourself for us. You took your wrath and gave us your righteousness. And Lord, we're so thankful for it. And Lord, you don't just cover sin, you take it away. And Lord, the old covenant is done away with and the new covenant has been ushered in. And so, Lord, we're so thankful for it. And Lord, I pray that uh, for our country... Even, even this evening, Lord, there's a lot of thoughts, a lot of emotions uh, going on. And, Lord, I pray that uh, your will be done, whatever that is. And Lord, we'll give you the honor and glory and praise for all that you do. Lord, all those that were mentioned tonight, the sicknesses, and, Lord, the, those that have deaths in the families, Lord, I pray that you'd be with them and uplift them. And, uh, Lord, may they look to you. Uh, for you, in, in your word for their comfort and Lord as, as the Holy Spirit uses that word to minister to them thank you again for all you do for us Lord uh, and I know these are weird times that we live in uh, but Lord you knew this was coming all before we ever did and Lord I, you know even though we live in these crazy times the commands that you give us about sharing the gospel with other people being a witness Lord that, that does not stop that does not fade that does not wane and, Lord, I pray that during these times that, again, people thinking about death and people worried and scared. And, Lord, I pray that we would use that. And I pray that you could use that in the hearts to, to turn people towards you in these last days that we live. Thank you again for all your love and mercy that you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen.